Good morning, everyone. Uh, in our mini series on condensate fluctuations, we have the second and final episode today. And the speaker is Jan Arlt, our colleague from Aarhus, Denmark. Jan is a German physicist. He, he did his undergraduate studies in Hanover and then moved to Oxford to get his PhD, then returned to Hanover, then maybe spent some time somewhere else that I don't know. And now he's a professor, he's the group leader uh, in Denmark doing very, very good, uh, nice experiments with, with Bose-Einstein condensate. So Jan, it's a pleasure of having you uh, give this talk and the screen is yours, please. Well, thank you very much for the very nice introduction and for the opportunity to, uh, to share our work in this mini series. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear the first part last time, uh, getting some more information on the theory of fluctuations, which you're doing in Warsaw. Warsaw and um, and uh, which we collaborate on. So uh, let me uh, tell you about our observation of fluctuations in the quantum gas and our quest for solving the question of which ensemble to use in a theoretical description. So what was our motivation? As you know, quantum gases have started to play a major role in quantum simulation, in quantum computing efforts, and in precision measurements. Precision measurements are not so much governed by quantum gases yet, but they are governed uh, by classical gases, which uh, provide, for example, the atomic clock or other atomic sensors. However, uh, as you know, we are advancing in our measurement of physical properties from simple measurements of time, such as this uh, sundial, to advanced clocks and to uh, very sophisticated clocks so far based on thermal atoms. But in the future, we may want to go on to uh, experiments like ours, which is not a clock, but can provide proof of principle experiments towards such precision measurements. And by using not thermal ensembles, not classical atoms, but by using BECs, one may, may gain a crucial advantage. And uh, that, could, that crucial advantage can be based, for example, on the coherence properties of BEC, and obviously also on their very narrow distribution of velocities. And, and here are two examples of such efforts underway, both in Australia and the US. So BECs may be a future quantum sensor. And in that sense, it's particularly interesting to see what advantages these BECs can yield um, beyond the advantages uh, of, their, of, their, of their inherent coherence. Well, one of them is that the BECs with their relatively high densities allow for nonlinear effects to take place. And if you can uh, let nonlinear effects take place, you can actually go from relatively simple coherent states to squeeze states. And here's a squeeze state, such a Dickey state, which we, which we made uh, a number of years ago and which allowed us to pass from uh, measurements above the standard quantum limits to measurements below the standard quantum limit where we are actually better than the measurements that could be performed on a coherent state. Well, what does that require? Well, it requires control and understanding of quantum many body systems. So we want to go from our uh, BECs to uh, BECs with entanglement uh, or squeezing. And um, we also want to know what are the ultimate limits of such a measurement. And this is where we are working, uh, where, where our motivation comes in. We want to know what are the ultimate limits of using a BEC. In particular, what are the limits imposed by the fact that atoms can pass from the BEC to the thermal cloud and back and these are the kind of fluctuations that we are investigating. So in a sense, uh, we see our work as a way to probe the ultimate limit of measurements with BECs in it admittedly the slightly more distant future of using BECs in quantum senses. So here's a brief outline of our path towards that problem. I will briefly discuss the BEC production process uh, as you 
uh, most most of you surely know, and and point out some of the difficulties that production process has. I will then take two steps towards an improved production process, which are uh, the use of non-destructive images and the feedback to stabilize the production of ultra cold clouds. And finally, then I will spend the largest part of my talk on the discussion of the observation of fluctuations, which we've already done and published in uh, uh, collaboration with Kazix group, but also on the detailed characterization, which we are well publishing for hopefully as we speak. Um, the, uh, the uh, paper is not on the archive yet, but but very close to it. So, um, very briefly, you know that uh, as we cool a gas, we go from the limit of high temperatures and classical particles to particles with larger and larger de Broglie wavelength. And once these uh, de Broglie wavelengths start to overlap, we form a BEC. And in uh, a non-interacting case, that would mean that all the particles then uh, uh, inhabit the very lowest energy state of our system. This could be the k equals zero state in free space, or it could be the lowest state of any, cho any choice of traffic potential that we have. And this is the sort of relatively simplistic view of BEC that we often take. And we, uh, we often neglect the fact that the distribution function of of the BEC actually also has higher moments. So beyond the simple um, probabilistic distribution of a certain energy state, there are higher moments which correspond to jumping particles jumping in and out of the BEC. Here we, we see the large uh, thermal cloud as the base of this pillar and then the BEC as the top of this pillar and, and particles would be leaving the BEC into the thermal cloud. The thermal cloud would have to appropriately redistribute and particles may also enter the BEC. And these are again the fluctuations that we want to deal with and that we want to characterize in detail. So what was known about these fluctuations or what's, what's a very brief uh, view of the history of these fluctuations? Well, when we typically derive the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in uh, an undergraduate statistical mechanics course, we take a grand, grand canonical ensemble approach. And uh, that, while that leads to the correct um, particle number in the BEC, it completely fails when describing the fluctuations. So on the left here, you see the variance of the particle number in the BEC shown as a function of, of the um, normalized temperature where BEC sets in at T over TC equals to one. And in this grand canonical ensemble approach, the fluctuations will completely diverge at, uh, at TC, uh, which, which uh, is the sort of grand canonical catastrophe um, of, uh, of, of BEC production. And the first one to sort of worry about this and, and, and see the problems with this was actually Schrodinger, who, uh, who saw the, the problems in this approach. Nonetheless, it took uh, many, many years in order to, to treat this problem um, uh, in more detail. And uh, the person who then made a significant contribution in uh, only in 1996 was Hugh Pulitzer, who uh, treated, who found the lowest um, uh, order variance of the non-interacting canonical gas uh, in 1996. So the, the, that, uh, that approximation is given here as a formula for the variance. And you can see that it scales with the number of particles and the temperature cubed, and it's shown as the black line here. And these two limiting cases actually already give us a fairly good impression of what's going to happen here. As we lower the temperature, we will have a very sudden onset of fluctuations which actually, and Kasich has pointed this out many times, can serve as a better determination of the phase transition to BEC. And then as the, as the gas is cooled and the number of uh, particles in the BEC grows and the number of uh, thermal atoms decreases, less and less possibility for uh, these, these fluctuations exists, less and less thermal states uh, are, uh, can be populated. And therefore, as we uh, cool the gas, the, the number of uh, the variance then falls again down to the, well, not actually to zero, but 
to the quantum depletion at t equals zero. In 1997, it was found that, that at least in the canonical harmonically trapped case, this can be described exactly when interactions are not taken into account. And, and these were the exact canonical relations which were, were used in some of our calculations and which I will refer to as the canonical result in the following as it provides a benchmark for us. And in particular, it provides a benchmark for the um, microcanonical uh, interacting calculations now performed by the, by the Warsaw group. So this is in a sense what we are hunting after here. We are wanting to first observe such fluctuations. And then obviously we want to see whether we can detect a difference from this canonical uh, non-interacting case. And in important contributions were again uh, made, made by the Warsaw group uh, in also in 1997 here where the um, so-called Maxwell Demon Ensemble was introduced as a way of understanding what's going on in these ensembles. And, and here is the little demon shown. You all know the Maxwell demon, which opens this door for hot or cold uh, 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 particles to pass from one to the other reservoir. Here, my view of the demon is a little bit different. This, this demon in this case makes sure that we rearrange the particles in the thermal cloud uh, such that we keep uh, the, uh, the, that we conserve energy during our uh, fluctuations from the BEC to the thermal cloud, which require a sort of uh, yeah, subtle redistribution of the, of the energies. So, so, so actually this paper from 1997 already um, introduced one of the decisive formulas, which I will be referring to in a little bit, which showed in particular that the microcanonical ensemble yields a, a significant, significantly different result from the canonical one. And it is that difference which we will be exploiting. In particular, the group also showed then two years later that, that um, based on the similar formalisms, one can also treat the weakly interacting those einstein condensate. And I will also come back to current calculations based on those results. So here is again uh, the, uh, the, the formula given, given by, by Pulitzer in lowest order of the, of the uh, fluctuations. But then um, when we go from this canonical approach to the microcanonical approach, the, an important addition comes into play. And you see that as the second factor in this equation here. The first factor is the, the same one as Pulitzer and the dependence is also the same. But the second factor shows the reduction that we expect in fluctuations due to the, due to the microcanonical treatment of the system. And it's this reduction which is quite striking because it can actually be relatively large. Let me show you what the, what the current calculations show. Here's a calculation done for um, 1000 atoms by the Warsaw group. Um, the uh, black line is again, the exact canonical result uh, based on the 1997 uh, recursion relations. And then, um, and then the, the, the group has also calculated a canonical result, which is an exact agreement with that given by the, the black field symbols. And when then interactions are added, we see a small increase. It, it's relatively minor and will be hard to detect for us. More importantly, we see a striking um, uh, reduction in fluctuations uh, as predicted by the formula I just showed when we go to the microcanonical ensemble. And that's, those are the filled blue symbols. Again, interactions only make a small difference here, increasing the fluctuations a tiny bit uh, in that microcanonical case. And we saw the theory uh, that this, these results are based on presented last week. So in that sense, I'm now picking up exactly where we left last week by looking at the results of those calculations and comparing them with experiments. So how will we uh, characterize these? Well, actually this image already gives us an idea of what a good characterization may be. The parameter that we are going to exploit, uh, we call S, this reduction parameter, simply takes the uh, peak microcanonical variance, so the peak of the blue curve here, and compares it to the peak of the canonical variance. So the one, the one shown up here. 
And clearly, this is going to provide us with a parameter s, which is smaller than one, and characterizes the reduction due to the microcanonical ensemble view. And here is, um, here is now a non-interacting calculation, which shows exactly what we expect from S. And this is very much inspiration for then our experimental work. As we, uh, as we vary the aspect ratio, that's the, the, the uh, x-axis here, this parameter S is actually varying considerably. And in the case of very elongated traps, so approaching the 1D case, um, the, uh, the, the, the factor S is actually approaching one. And this is, this is clear because in the 1D ensemble or in the 1D case, the microcanonical and the canonical ensemble actually are shown to agree. Whereas when we then go in the other direction, so we go to uh, round traps, spherically symmetric traps, and we go to large atom numbers. So we, we, we approach the thermodynamic limit in a, for a large, spherically symmetric trap, we actually approach the limiting value given by the formula I showed previously. So that would be S equals 0 0.39, which is shown as a dashed line down. So, so one way of characterizing our results would be to then map out exactly this landscape of the reduction with respect to the canonical result, which we can always calculate. Whereas the microcanonical result, especially the microcanonical result, uh, with interactions is extremely time consuming to, to compute. So this shows you uh, our motivation or our path based on the existing, on the, on the existing theory. So what's the problem? Why have these measurements not been done for a long, long time, given that BEC is now approaching or is now uh, beyond 25 years of age? Well, we typically start uh, with a magneto-optical trap when we, uh, when we make, start making our BEC. So here, our magneto-optical trap of rubidium-87 is shown. We then take the atoms from that magneto-optical trap to a region where we have better vacuum. In that region of better vacuum, we then confine the atoms, in our case, magnetically, and we evaporate in order to remove the hottest uh, atoms, and thus, produce the colder and colder ensembles in which the phase space density can grow to the required values in order to create both Einstein condensates. And finally, we can check whether we have a Bose Einstein condensate or not by releasing our, our sample and taking, taking an, an image on a slightly more sophisticated CCD camera than the one shown here. And the images that you, all, that you all know and that much of our work is based on look like the one on the right here. We have a, a, a very cold uh, BEC in the center, and we have a, a relatively large thermal cloud, cloud around it. And the pictures I showed previously were just 3D renderings of this image. And we are now looking for the exact number in the thermal cloud and the exact number in the BEC. And if we could pre pre prepare this experiment under the exact same conditions every time, all we would have to do is count the number in the thermal cloud, count the number in the BEC, and calculate the variance. Obviously, that is difficult. So when we, when we go through this uh, uh, sequence of different steps in making the experiment, where we find that we typically have 10% technical fluctuations. And this is general, not only for us, but pretty much for all experiments around the world, because we run these experiments somewhat in the blind. We wait for a certain number of atoms to accumulate in the first place, but from then on, the entire experiment is run by a computer sequence, which does not check along the way how many atoms there were, or does not actually provide any feedback. It's just a blind algorithm. And that leads to these 10% fluctuations due to all kinds of technical processes that can go on along the way. And obviously that impedes the, uh, the, the, the observation of fluctuations in the BEC because these fluctuations occur on uh, something like uh, the square root of n uh, the, um, order of magnitude. And, and in that sense, we're not going to be able to see them. 
So we have to do better. And our way to do better is to take some images along the way. And I will be describing how we take non-destructive so-called Faraday images along the way. And then we can provide feedback. That is, we can take the images from, uh, we can take those Faraday images, feed their information through a fast processor, and then feed back to our production mechanism of BEC, the cooling, the cooling mechanism, which then provides us with much more uh, uh, equally uh, numbered thermal clouds before production of BEC. So, um, so these are the two decisive steps, and, and I will briefly go through those before discussing the fluctuations. First of all, what are these images that we take? Well, uh, the Faraday effect, uh, you all know it classically, um, means that when I go through a, a Faraday active medium, the polarization of the light I'm sending through can turn, and this will result to a Faraday angle uh, of the light. Uh, one can also do that, treat this problem quantum mechanically, and a semi-classical treatment will then yield that such a Faraday rotation is simply proportional to the integral of the atomic density. So clearly, if we can measure this Faraday rotation, so the uh, rotation of the polarization of the light, we can infer back to the density. And that's exactly what we do. We take some light, we arrange this light to be uh, reflected of a cube if it was not shifted, uh, if its polarization was not turned. However, when its polarization is turned by the BEC, shown here, and this is the dark red portion of the light, which is turned in polarization, if it's turned in polarization, it will propagate through this um, polarizer and then be detected on the camera. So on the camera, we will see an image of the optical density corresponding to, the, to how much it turned the polarization. And such a, an image is shown here. This is our signal, and this is now a, an atomic cloud detected non-destructively through its rotation of the polarization. And the Faraday signal is then that we observe on the camera is then related to the sine squared of this, of this polarization. And ultimately, the signal we, we, we detect by summing all the pixels on, the, on our camera is, uh, is proportional to the number of atoms squared divided by the temperature. So we can, we can uh, infer non-destructively, and in fact, with very high precision, how many atoms we have. And actually, um, three years ago, we, we uh, quantized how well we can detect atom numbers uh, in an experiment. And we showed that when we, when we add up all the different um, uh, processes that can lead to noise, i.e. photon shot noise, technical noise, and noise from atom loss, we can arrive at a value which is below this green line. And this green line is actually the shot noise limit. And you can see now on the x-axis, if we take enough of these Faraday images, let's say 30, we, have, uh, we, can, we can count our atom number significantly, significantly be below shot noise, i.e. we can determine our atom number to better than square root of the atom number itself. So this is obviously our prerequisite because if we couldn't detect to that uh, precision, then we wouldn't be able to feedback to that precision, uh, such as to pro provide such extremely stable atom numbers for an evaluation of the fluctuations. How do we then feedback? Well, we take the result of our, of our Faraday measurement here, we, uh, we process it, um, and uh, this, process, this process signal is then fed back to our RF synthesizer, which runs the evaporative cooling of the BEC, which removes the hottest atoms. And thereby, we cut our distribution at the, at the appropriate uh, position in order to arrive at the preset atom number that we have chosen. So rather than letting the experiment decide which atom number um, we, we, uh, we use, we now preset an atom number, and that preset atom number is the one we will be working. And this is actually also quite important for the measurements we have performed, 
because uh, for many of them, we will want to choose the atom number and we will want to make an active choice of how many atoms uh, we use in our measurement of the fluctuations. So how does such a measurement uh, uh, work or how does the uh, characterization of these of these uh, destabilization work? Well, we, oops, we evaporate. Um, that's the first part of this curve. And this first evaporation gives us a, about 6 million atoms at a temperature of about 18 microkelvins. And at that point, we uh, apply our first series of, in our case, 50 Faraday images. And you see the outcome of the uh, signal uh, in the image on the right here. And you can see that uh, each of these traces here in different colors is a given realization. So for this realization, we had uh, a lesser number for the realization up here, we had a higher number. But, but each, each of these traces are 50 images of the exact same cloud in a single realization of the experiment. And it differs, as you can see, considerably. We then, we then apply our loss pulse. So in gray shown here is the pulse which we apply and we tailor the length of uh, which then uh, uh, removes atoms until we have reached the exact point that we want to reach. And finally, we can take uh, further images in our case, uh, or in the case of this test here, we took 100 images more, and you can suddenly see that all the traces now lie exactly on top of each other. So by the time we say we took our second set of images, all the uh, individual experiments have uh, fallen on the exact same trace. And that allows us to stabilize our atom number. And it's only after that point that we can then perform the experiment, which in our case will be the investigation of fluctuations. And this process was, was characterized in detail in 2016 as a general method for improving BEC experiments. So with that, we come to the, the real topic, and that is the detection and investigation of fluctuations in BECs. So here is our, our uh, type of image, image, we have stabilized uh, our atom number very well. And then we, we have taken the last step towards boson chain condensation and taken an image. And as I said before, our task will now, based on these very well stabilized atom numbers, be to distinguish the number in the thermal cloud and the number in the BEC and evaluate the variance when we take a number of, of, of when we do a number of such experiments. So here is the more, the, the, the sort of advanced um, experimental sequence con corresponding to this experiment. The first part we already know, we evaporate some time, we take our first set of Faraday images, we apply the tailored loss, and then we evaporate further. At this point, we have to be a little bit more cautious. And the, the, the reason we have to be more cautious is because our experiments are typically performed in a relatively elongated trap with aspect ratio up to 20 or 30. And such an elongated trap leads to the formation of so-called phase fluctuations. So the phase across the BEC is not entirely stable. And when you release such a BEC, it uh, can lead to uh, some funny structures in the density distribution. Therefore, we have to decompress our trap. We do that here. That's indicated by the vertical line. So the trap becomes much rounder. And then we can, in this very round trap, we can then perform the last evaporation towards BEC. We then have to make sure that this BEC is left to equilibrate for a relatively long amount of time because we want to make sure that we actually do not see the uh, let's say free evaporation effects due to the last evaporation step, but that we observe the actual uh, fluctuations between BC and uh, thermal cloud. So we have a relatively long time here of four seconds in which the BEC just sits into in our experiment. And finally, then we take an absorption image. So the whole process takes about two minutes. And we, at a, at a given set of experimental parameters, that is for a given trap and for a given temperature, we repeat this 60 times. And then we can do it again for a lower temperature in order to trace out the temperature dependence of the fluctuations you saw before. Um, and we do that for various temperatures. So here's such a sequence is, sequence is, is shown. 
60 images are taken slightly before BEC, 60 images are taken with a, a relatively warm BEC just uh, below TC. And then you can see here, uh, this, uh, this last set here corresponds to 60 images taken at a, under very cold conditions where the, the thermal cloud is hardly visible anymore. It takes, to, to make a good measurement, it actually takes about 4,000 repetitions of the experiments. So, so you can see that even, even obtaining a single trace for a single type of trap is quite uh, demanding. What do we do then? Well, we count the number of atoms in the center here corresponding to the BC, and we count the number of atoms in the thermal cloud. And that allows us to extract the number total the, num the temperature and the number in the bees. And in principle, you would think, fantastic, I'm done. I just have to calculate the variance of the BEC number as shown here, and I can evaluate the, uh, the, the, the fluctuations of the BEC by looking at this variance. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. And I show, I show you the uh, an impression uh, here when we actually plot all the data, so these are all the directly evaluated atom numbers and temperatures, we uh, get such a trace. And the um, variance that we're actually looking for would actually be, would actually correspond to the thickness of this trace uh, of the data. And you can see that it actually becomes relatively wide here. And, um, and clearly this will probably not allow for the, for the observation of fluctuations. So we have to do better than just that. And we have to find the reason why the variance is not as small as we would have hoped it to be. Well, and the reason for that are remaining drifts. So we, uh, we, we stabilize our atom number very precisely just before making BEC when the clouds are still of appropriate size in order for the Faraday imaging to work properly. BECs itself, we cannot stabilize because they're simply too small to get an appropriately good Faraday image. So that means we take our stabilized cloud and then we make the last step of evaporation again, unfortunately, in the blind. And in that last step of evaporation, our trap can drift slightly. So our trap offset drifts slightly and that slight trap in, in uh, uh, that slight drift in trap offset will also lead to a slight variation in temperature. You can sort of get an impression of what is going on here. In this graph or in this cartoon, I show you a very well stabilized atom number here at about 5, 10 to the 6 atoms and a temperature of 17 microkelvin. And then if we evaporate, and depending on the exact depth of the trap, we may reach different points in, uh, in temperature and atom number. However, temperature and atom number will be very tightly co correlated after this evaporation. If the trap is slightly uh, deeper, we will have higher atom numbers and higher temperatures. If the trap is slightly shallower, we will have lower uh, numbers and accordingly lower temperatures. So there is a very close and tight co correlation here to the very small interval which we are accessing. If we plot our data in the same manner, you can see it here. So this is a single shot of 60 uh, measurements taken in a, in a given trap for a given uh, set end frequency of our evaporation. And, and this is, again, a, a very small interval. Maybe this is most clearly seen on the left in temperature here. We are talking about an interval between 138 and 146 nanokelvin. So this is an interval of only eight nanokelvin in which our final result lies. So it's a tiny, tiny window which is uh, um, provided by these remaining <laughs> drifts of the of the trap. And in this tiny window, um, again, number and temperature are are tightly correlated, so we can make such a linear fit. And equally, uh, the uh, BEC atom number and the total atom number are also tightly correlated. And that, that hints at the type of variance we are going to calculate. We're not going to take the straight variance of these, of these 60 measurements, but we will take the variance with respect to this, this linear correlation fit and evaluate 
the difference between these uh, measurements with respect to this field. I can actually show you that this is a this this provides a big improvement when looking at number and temperature. So typically for a given measurement, we will extract a given temperature. So this data point here, let me go back. Oops, this blue data point here would be recorded at a different at a given atom number and it would correspond to a different given temperature. However, we will not assign this directly measured temperature now, which has a large error bar, but instead we will assign it the temperature that is provided by the correlation measurement. And when I do that to all of my data, you can see what happens to the curve on the left. It becomes significantly narrow. And it's exactly this effect which we are making use of. We are making use of these correlations in order to uh, uh, arrive at a much better estimate of the of the atom numbers in the PEC and thereby, thereby narrowing our uh, uh, variance and bottoming out at the variances that we actually have for the atom numbers. So here, here that is shown. These are the uh, our results for a given trap configuration. Um, you see the bare results of the variances here. One one such uh, uh, data set is shown on the left. We uh, take 60 measurements, we calculate the variances, variance, and that variance now corresponds to one blue point on the left. And you see that we observe very low variances for thermal clouds above TC. And then below TC, we see a sharp increase of the variance, which then falls off again as we, as we lower temperature even further. And we can, we can compare that to the uh, canonical exact calculation shown in, in blue here. So, so you can see that the shape is strikingly similar. However, um, there is actually a shift. And we, we, we quantify that shift by making a fit, which is inspired by the canonical theory. So it has a, a cubic temperature dependence, but it uh, allows for a free off onset point here. And that onset point actually uh, is, is very much in agreement with the shift of TC that one would expect due to interactions in the, in, the, in the ensemble. And again, the peak variance is actually in similarly good, uh, in, in seemingly good agreement with the uh, exact canonical calculation, not taking into actions into account. And this was indeed the first observation of these fluctuations at all. And uh, it was already published together uh, with Kazik's group. As you can see on the bottom here, this came out in PRL in, in April of last year and really provided the first observation, um, but not the full characterization. And that's what I'm talking about today. Can we go beyond uh, this first observation? And can we find out more about exactly this agreement or in fact, not agreement, between our data uh, and the canonical result. So what inspired us to do that in, uh, in the first instance was actually not the ensemble questions, I have to admit. But we were, we were inspired by the question whether uh, interactions influence the picture. So uh, the canonical uh, calculation here obviously does not include interactions. And the question was, what will interactions do? Uh, our naive assumption had been that they uh, reduce the fluctuations. But this is actually not clear. Here's a, a, a collection of different theoretical results shown uh, from groups that have treated the problems over this problem over the years. And it shows the interacting theoretical result with respect to the canonical result um, or the ideal result as a function of the interaction strength. And you can see that some of these uh, theoretical results actually show uh, a, an increase, whereas others show a slight decrease. Uh, and all of them have relatively large errors. So this was the open question for us. However, the most recent uh, calculations, which I already showed you in the very beginning, actually show a different picture. They show that the effect of interactions is very small. That's the difference between the full and the open symbols. Whereas the effect of 
using a canonical or a microcanonical treatment of the problem is very significant. So um, uh, further collaboration with the uh, Warsaw Group has actually um, uh, resulted in the fact that what we are looking at is not interactions, but we are in fact much more influenced by uh, the question which ensemble is the correct one to describe our system and and as you can imagine for a, a well isolated BEC um, it is the microcanonical one uh, and, and that's what I'm going to prove through our experiments. So what do we have to do? Well we would like to characterize thus the difference between our measurements and a, a canonical treatment in detail. The microcanonical treatment cannot be done at, uh, exact parameter, at the exact parameters of the uh, experiment because we have very large atom numbers and we are unfortunately not in the position to reduce those. But the canonical treatment can always be applied. And that means we can always compare experiment versus the canonical treatment and exactly extract this parameter S here that had also been looked at in theory. So it's a mapping of S that was our A. Clearly, this is, a, this is actually slightly complicated. And you can see that in the upper graph here. If we, if we uh, do a, an evaporative cooling, uh, well, if we perform an experiment, we, we do evaporative cooling. That means we come in with a certain atom number, but we, we decrease both temperature and atom number at the, at the same time. So, so in, this, in this space of temperature and atom number, we actually take such diagonal tra trajectories and we have to recompute uh, the canonical result for each given uh, step on our evaporation sequence, such as to be able to compare. And you can see if we come in with a larger atom number, and that larger atom number, we are now free to choose using our stabilization technique, we will actually arrive at a larger peak fluctuation value as shown by the calculation. here. So it's trajectories here that we are actually examining and we are then comparing the peak value in experiments to the peak value of the canonical uh, theory. And the two free parameters of our experiments are then the atom number at the transition and the aspect ratio of our uh, our trapping configuration. So we repeat the experiment that I had outlined before, taking about four thousand shots for a number of choices, and uh, given the large number of data that is required, the number of points was also limited. So we did this for in total thirteen configurations of different atom numbers and traps, and extracted and extracted data as shown here. Again, this is, this is more or less the same as I showed before. The black line is the canonical uh, exact theory without interactions. The blue data points are the measured variances. And the blue line is actually a slightly more sophisticated fit to the data in, uh, um, uh, to the data in this case. It takes the cubic dependence on the temperature into account. Um, but it also takes the uh, horizontal error bars of our data into account by folding our fit function with the temperature in our experiment. And that gives this softer onset here of the blue curve with respect to um, the, uh, the, 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 the calculated. So in principle, one would expect that, that for each of these 13 measurements, we can now characterize this parameter S and get, uh, get, uh, get 13 values of the reduction with respect to the canonical result. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that is not possible. These results, are, these, these fits are not stable enough in order to, to sort of uh, give you such a reduction for each individual value uh, reliably. However, we can now take these, these uh, we can now take all of our data points and plot them as a function of uh, the aspect ratio that's on the on the uh, y-axis, let me call it here, and um, and then uh, also as a function of the atom number, which is on the x-axis, and we can plot the measured variance uh, shown on the z-axis here, and those that corresponds to all the data points uh, as as given here, and the 
the vertical lines then show where these sit on in this space of, of aspect ratio and number. And then we can compare with the, uh, with the non-interacting canonical theory as follows. We take that result, we take that theoretical result and scale it in order to fit our, our data. And that is shown here. So uh, we, uh, we compare our uh, experimental result to the canonical one by allowing for this fit factor here. And this factor, this factor contains the overall reduction. So essentially now the, uh, we allow the, the theory to be scaled down, but it also allows for a scaling, uh, a linear scaling with the uh, aspect ratio and a logarithmic scaling with the number. And these scalings were inspired again by the theoretical result that we had seen before. And, um, and we apply that fit and, and here is the outcome. We have to, we, we observe a clear reduction with respect to the canonical results. So our reduction factor is actually 0.73. So uh, we see uh, essentially a 27% reduction of the, of, the, uh, of the fluctuations or the variance with respect to the canonical result. But we do not actually see a very small, uh, a very significant effect of either the aspect ratio or the atom number. And this, to us, confirms that the main effect we have uh, we have to deal with is actually the description of a microcanonical system, and we thus prove that in fact a microcanonical description is necessary in order to understand the fluctuations, um, and that this is the main effect rather than the density or the atom number affecting the, the result. And, uh, and with that, we have provided a, a first and important characterization. And we have actually made quite a significant contribution in the sense that, that a large portion of the existing theoretical results have been ruled out. And we can now focus on further, uh, on further descriptions of the system based on a microcanonical formalism. And with that, I'm actually, I'm actually finished. Uh, I hope I've given you a, a good motivation of why we're doing this work. I've shown you how we experimentally take the important steps towards being able to measure the fluctuations. And I hope I've shown you that, that our results clearly show that the microcanonical understanding of the fluctuations is necessary. Finally, let me point out who actually did the work. Um, Miguel Christensen has uh, done much of the experimental work in the lab. He's just defended his PhD and is now finished. Toke Wiebel is uh, still a PhD in, in my group and has done much of this group. Uh, very decisive initial work was done by Andrew Hilliard, who's also left the group. He was a postdoc and is now back in New Zealand. And the current experiment is actually run to a large extent by Mick Christensen, who is the, the working postdoc on the experiment. And we have enjoyed a very, very fruitful um, theory collaboration with Kazakh's group in Warsaw. And our uh, manuscript is in the final stages of preparation. Actually, we're now waiting on feedback only from Andrew from New Zealand, and it should then be on the archive in the coming few days. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan, for a beautiful lecture. Let's applaud it.